politics, communalism, and the social fabric of India. But I think uh, we're going to narrow it down a little and probably talk about the social fabric of Bombay, since that's the city we're in, and that's the city we've reported on, all of us. Um, to help us understand this, I'm really glad to have two people with me who I've known for 20 years now. Shows how old you are. <laughs> Meena Menon, who's the deputy editor of The Hindu, as you were just told, and Harish Nambiar, who works for Reuters. Um, the three of us agree, I think, that the way we've conducted uh, journalism over our careers has been shaped by a singular experience. The experience of covering the horrific Bombay riots of 92, uh, December 92 and January 93, and the bomb blast that followed on uh, March the 12th, 1993. Bombay has become almost unrecognizable since then. Its economy, which was still largely based on manufacturing two decades ago, is now overwhelmingly powered by the service sector. But many of those service sector jobs uh, are in the informal sector, which means that uh, the workers are deprived of the provisions and the protections of the Minimum Wages Act, of workplace safety, and many other things that are essential for people to live in dignity. This informality has imprinted itself on the city's very landscape. Uh, the proportion of people living in slums has uh, more than doubled from 23% in 1991 to about 48% uh, in the 2011 census. And the changes in the economy have caused other physical changes also. The mills of Parel have given way to gated communities for the rich and where Bombay once valued inclusive public spaces, uh, spaces, places like Marine Drive or Juhu Beach, it has now come to celebrate the exclusivity of malls and similar enclaves of uh, high-end consumption. It isn't just the economic changes of the last 20 years that have caused uh, Bombay's cartography to be altered. The riots have played a significant part in rearranging the city's geography. Since 1993, we have seen the rise of Muslim enclaves in places like Mumbra and Jogeshwari, as well as Jain enclaves in neighborhoods like uh, Malabar Hill, which, uh, if some people have their way, according to today's papers, may soon be renamed uh, Ramnagri. Though we've experienced so many profound transformations over the past uh, two decades, and the Bombay riots just seem like a distant memory, uh, the events of the past couple of weeks remind us that some things haven't actually changed. Just yesterday, the papers reported uh, Uddhav Thakre saying that the Shiv Sena would continue to support the NDA only if Hindutva was still on its agenda. Where were the secularists when Hindus were attacked in 1992-93? He was quoted as saying, somewhat disingenuously trying to claim victimhood, even though if you look at the list of the people who died in those riots, you learn that of the 900 people who died during the Bombay riots, about 275 were Hindu and 575 were Muslim. Meena Menon and Harish Nambiar have written books that complement each other in the way they try to understand communalism and its effect on the social fabric. Meena's uh, Riots and After in Mumbai, Chronicles of Truth and Reconciliation, uses both archival research as well as the old-fashioned journalistic method of wearing out uh, chappal leather as she's vi uh, visited various parts of the city uh, to interview people who were caught up with the riots as she tries to make sense of the aftermath of that enormous violence. Harish's book is called uh, Defragmenting India, Riding a Bullet Through the Gathering Storm. And he uses the form of the travelogue to tell a personal story about how the Gujarat riots were affecting the people and the places that he met on his long journey through the country in 2002. One of the people he met is there, the gentleman with the silver hair who's now looking away. Uh, but the Bombay riots are a motif to which he keeps returning, whether he's writing about Vapi, where he grew up, or Sambalpur in Orissa. So to give you a sense of their books, I'm going to begin by asking each of them to read a small section. Okay, I'm going to read from the preface because uh, I think just to explain why I wrote this book. I went backwards from the 92-93 post Babri Masjid demolition riots to look at the history of violence between Hindus and Muslims in Bombay, Mumbai, because it was not called Mumbai 100 years ago. 
And the archives reveal interesting details about the communal uh, situation which worsened during partition. Today, it is common to hear the word ghetto and to think of Muslims as the other and terrorists. In fact, many Muslims were denied houses because of who they are. For them, jobs are hard to come by and the sense of alienation is evident. The popular perception about Muslims is that all Muslims are not terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. The situation became worse after the Babri Masjid de demolition on 6 December 92 and the riots in Mumbai in 92-93, the worst it is possibly seen. The riots were followed by the serial blasts in the city on 12th March 93, which killed 257 people and injured 713. Anger spilled out against Muslims and many people told me, at that time I was a reporter with the Times of India, that Muslims were never the victims of the riots, that they were in fact the aggressors and the blast proved that. The government appointed the Sri Krishna Commission to investigate the riots, which came up with an extensive document that has all been, uh, that has all but been all but shelved. While the serial blast accused were arrested under the Terrorist and Disruptive Activities Prevention Act, now repealed, the state conducted a highly publicized and prolonged trial which began on 30th June 95 and resulted in 100 convictions, including death sentences. The uproar of the lack of justice for riot victims and their families became sharper after that. After the riots, the other police station registered a total of nine cases against Shiv Sena, Mouthpiece Samna, and its editor, Mr. Bal Thakre, who is the founder of the Shiv Sena. Six cases ended in acquittal, three were closed. The applications were filed against the acquittal orders. The Bombay High Court, while dismissing the civil application on Feb 23, 2007, observed that no ends of justice would be served by digging up the old cases after an expiry of seven years, that they would only revive communal tension. The difference was obvious. Terror will be punished with death, but rioters needn't worry. Old wounds need not be reopened. So deep was the belief that the riots were in fact a war against Muslim invaders that the Shiv Sena assumed the role of the heroic avenger and along with the BJP went on to win its first ever assembly elections in Maharashtra. The Sena says that the riots were spontaneous and if it wasn't for the Senics, the Hindus would have been decimated. After the riots, which split the city like never before, perceptions about Muslims have hardened. The repeated bomb blasts too have worsened the situation. Soon after another terrorist strike in suburban local trains on 11 July 2006, the Mumbai police put up posters everywhere titled Mumbai Unbreakable, cautioning its numbed residents to be brave and alert. Mumbai is often called a resilient and unbreakable city, but its famed resilience has been tested too many times and is wearing thin. And Harish, if you'll give us a sense of what your book sounds like. Since Meena's reading pretty much covered the riot, that doesn't leave much for me in terms of the riot. Fortunately, it's not also about <laughs> Bombay riot specifically. Um, what I am hoping to do is, uh, this book starts with me meeting my school friends in a small town in Gujarat. That is just two days after the Godra. So the riots are spreading within Gujarat. And we have foolishly, it, uh, it seems, set out on a biking trip without uh, taking into account the kind of violence we are hoping to, we are going to be heading through. Uh, I'm just to give you a kind of sense, we, when, when we reach Wapi, we have an eight to 10 people who are to meet together and we are to go to Daman to have a drink. And this first chapter is assessing how each one is variously affected. You know, if you are a Muslim, one, one Muslim boy is not allowed to join us because his father says the climate isn't very good. And that upsets another friend who is a bit of a toughie. And I'm going to read a bit from the conversation on the way to Daman in the car. And we have two cars and we are heading to Daman. This conversation I want you to understand uh, is not to be judgmental about people who are talking. They're all my friends. But also the point is some of them, uh, the way the characters come across, as in any regular day or any regular room, there is some who is rightist in terms of his association, you know, his political sympathies. There are others who are leftists and everywhere in between. So within this conversation, you will see, I hope to see uh, a kind of, uh, I'm trying, hoping to make a multiple voices come through to you as they are spoken without it being what you call tutored. So this is a small patch of the conversation. So have you been, have, have, have there been any incidents in Wapi? I inquired. Nahi re, not here. Nothing will happen here. When Suresh said that, this is what I was talking about. Suresh in my book is a bit of a tough character who's a little more 
is stronger, more of a bully kind of thing. When Suresh said that he was being an authoritative spokesperson for the town, someone who had some, some amount of control and understanding of the way the town reacted, or so he thought, and a large number of townspeople agreed. It will not happen here, mumbled Atul from the cramped back seat. He was talking as if asleep. His memory of recent history began after school days. That was the kind of statement that a majority of Bombayites had made till December 6, 1992. Now nearly nobody in Bombay makes such statements. It will never stop, Suresh says. If it is still here after so many years after partition, it is not going to stop, ever. I'm, I'm moving to the next patch of the conversation where I'm talking to Suresh. I said, what about the current riots? Will these killings stop? How long do you think it will take? Why? Why do you want it to end? It's the first time the Gujarati bhai has reacted. Let them do something. At least this time they have felt something. Thanks, Harish. So, Harish, um, I wanted to begin with you and ask um, how the, your book took its form. Did you set off to write a travelogue and did the events that transpired result in your book being focused on communalism or did you set off to write a book about communalism and decided that driving through India would be a good way to tell the story? No, I was, uh, I pretty much landed up in the riots like most common citizens do. It was a very foolishly planned trip and we were actually heading to Ladakh without even knowing that the, the roads would be closed at that point. And it was so spectacularly timed that the the time I reached Gujarat is the riots are spreading very strongly across. I mean, uh, Godra is over, but the backlash has started. And the, because my group of friends were of various denominations and regional uh, regions, the talk itself was only about the riots, which is natural because if you are in a state which is burning. And that set me free. That set me kind of rolling back into my traumatic days from, as a reporter while covering the 92-93 riots and eventually the, the bomb blast. And it is then that I discovered over the next three days, for example, you could not get the riots out of your mind. At the same time, I also decided I'm not going to do the, be the reporter I've always been, you know? You go and ask a person what do you feel, how did you, who, who created this situation, who hit you first, or how many, who first burnt the chawl. I wasn't interested in forensic details of individuals. I was suddenly feeling very weary, and I was hoping to let people do the talking. So there's lots of patches in this book where you will not find anybody talking about the riots. And yet, uh, while traveling, for example, from Gujarat, I cut back into Maharashtra. We decided to go to Orissa as opposed to Ladakh because Gujarat is going to be no more safe for us. And along the way, there are lots of, I see a cavalcade of trucks full of displaced people from Gujarat going towards, of all places, Malegaon. Uh, so it's, it's this that I'm trying to bring in without, I didn't want it to be a report so much as a meditation of the whole business of uh, communal as well as other differences within India and how difficult it is for a country of our riches to what do you call negotiate the borders between these groups and and uh, other differences including riches, caste. How did uh, you hit upon this idea of defragmenting or sort of very 20, 20, sort of late 20th century computer driven way of sort of this metaphor that you use to talk about the country? The main reason for that is, uh, it's a nice way to show off how illiterate I am about computers. And then I realized what the hell defragmenting means is supposedly putting a lot of uh, random files, you clean it up and put it, stack it up nicely. My problem is, like I said, because I didn't want to chase the theme of riots, there is patches in my book, for example, about how art is being affected by government uh, push and then how it gets uh, commercialized. Or there are sections, there is a section, for example, you would know about Riyaz Bhatkal. Riyaz Bhatkal has been charged with a bomb blast. But what you would probably not know, or many wouldn't know, is Bhatkal is a place in Karnataka. And a very fascinating place because it's the place where uh, pre-Islam Arabs landed. And 
there is a peculiar community called the Bhatkalis, Bhatkalis or Nawayats. The Nawayats are a community that has, that is uh, born out of uh, this Arab men who came and the Jain women, because at that point of time there were Jain rulers of that area. This Arab men and Jain women are, are form this community called the Nawayatis. It, it's, it's fascinating to figure out that they were before Islam arrived, they had arrived to our coast. And judge I was talking to, who's a Nawayati himself, she was telling me something very interesting. He said, even when the wars in the Deccan were going on, our community continued to, what you call, sell horses to Tipu Sultan or the French or whosoever. I mean, they didn't have any trouble whatsoever while they were, uh, the kingdoms were fighting to either expand or reduce their respective denomination. And Meena, what was, the, what was the genesis of your book? Actually, I did this um, uh, short-term fellowship by uh, Sarai. Uh, it's actually given for six months, and uh, uh, you can choose a topic. And, uh, and it's nice because they give you, uh, they leave it to you, and they don't have any pa parameters. And uh, we were just discussing it in office, and uh, both Ranjit, Ranjit Hoskote was a colleague at that time, and both of us thought this is a good idea, and... Uh, I thought, okay, let's go back because it's been a long time. And I decided to do this in 2006. That's about um, 16, 15 years after the riots happened. So though I had kept in touch with people and had reported on the cases in the middle, I didn't have uh, much, uh, I didn't know much about how people, especially in the worst affected areas, had survived. So the uh, initial Sarai Fellowship brief was very limited. It was just uh, interviews with uh, people who were affected. Um, survivors and uh, uh, victims had, I mean, had known in then. So it started like that. But when I made a presentation in Delhi, uh, a lot of people thought it would make a book. But um, I also felt that uh, just putting together stories won't be enough. And uh, I was also curious, though a lot of people have written about the 1893 uh, uh, riots and things like that, I was also curious to see what the archives had in Mumbai at Elphinstone College, and it was uh, extremely rewarding because uh, despite the red tape to get it out, people were helpful eventually, and uh, there's a humongous amount of material which other people have researched, and you know, like uh, Jim Maslow has done essays on it, and uh, Thomas Blom Hansen has written about it. Uh, but I just thought for myself, it was just, I know, it was very tedious also, but it was a lot of, very exciting to, actually go through that archive and come up with, and you know, you have a complete uh, understanding because you also get newspaper reports, uh, you also get uh, reports by the police, uh, very little of what common people say, but uh, there are letters, there are postcards, you know, all of it has been carefully collected and kept, so it was uh, really a treasure of information. And Among the fascinating things about your book is how sort of there's so many eerie historical parallels. A century ago, we've always had this notion that, you know, in 1993, we always said, you know, this could never happen in Bombay, and then it didn't happen in Bombay. And it turned out that it actually happened several times before in Bombay. Uh, can you tell us a little about the 1893 riots uh, and sort of uh, when, you, when you read the official records, they even happen in some of the same neighborhoods, but some of the same circumstances uh, were, were operated in. Uh, sort of a century apart. The 1893 riots, uh, there was a series of build-ups to that, but they weren't between Hindus and Muslims. There were riots from the 50s, if you read the police records. But I think uh, uh, that the paper which I've quoted is quite, qu quite a, it's an excellent paper which gives you the complete background of the whole cow protection movement and why the cow protection movement was the background for the riot. Uh, there were things happening in Gujarat. There were deaths in Gujarat. There were, I mean, this was, uh, you know, a fallout of what was happening in Gujarat, basically. And also people were mobilized and motivated over this whole issue of cow protection. So just like you had people being mobilized over For the Ram, Ram Mandir, Mandir, yeah. But, but there is also historical research to show that the cow protection may not be the only reason. So, uh, but it was prevalent, people were collecting money. The same people, the descendants of the same people are part of this movement now, the right wing. So uh, there was a strong, it, though nobody saw it as quite right wing at that time. So I think the seeds of uh, discord, you know, you can't eat meat, the Muslims eat meat. 
little things like that, which even in the, was happening in Uttar Pradesh at that time, as Gyaninda Pandey has documented very beautifully in his series of books. So it's a fallout of this whole, uh, uh, you know, anti, uh, you know, this polarized, po polarizing communities basically, because even the Muslims, they have other things. They, they, uh, it's not as if only the Muslims eat. Uh, uh, me, beef. I mean, other communities also do that. So it was uh, this upper caste kind of hegemonic kind of thing that was happening. And uh, I think uh, parallels can be drawn to some extent. But I think what happened in 92, 93 was also, uh, it was a, a clear-cut agenda, a clear-cut Hindutva agenda, which was, I think, not so evident a century earlier though the basis was there in terms of divisiveness and uh, polarization. You know, it's often very difficult to have conversations around communalism because they tend to be so polarizing. Uh, you know, we immediately tend to label people with an opposing point of view as bigots, and they call us pseudo-secularists. Uh, how do you open productive conversations uh, as a reporter without uh, getting locked into this sort of very sharp rhetoric, what were your challenges? See, I didn't interview people. It was not a dialectic kind of thing. Uh, I just, uh, because if you get into arguments, you're not going to get information. So that's been a kind of, uh, I mean, it's kind of limiting in a way I know, but then I feel that's a that's the best way because once you start, once people, it's very difficult to interview many of the people in this book. They didn't want to talk about it. And even though I said, don't talk about the riots, just tell me how you've lived, say, the last 10 years. But invariably, the conversations would get looped around what happened because that's the genesis of their current uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So how do you talk to people, for instance, the, the bunnies who, uh, who, who lost their family in a, in a very, uh, you know, in a fire that kind of... Uh, set off the whole second phase of the riots in 93. So I knew the Vanes from earlier and they, they were very uh, welcoming, they agreed and they also said that uh, they weren't interested in revenge. I mean, uh, I asked them, I said, the people who were caught in your case were acquitted by the Supreme Court. So they said, yes, I said, they will be punished. So, you know, when you see that there are similarities between both communities, in the sense that people believe there's a higher kind of authority which will give them justice because the courts and the, uh, the police haven't done a damn thing. I think, uh, for a footnote for people who don't know the specific incident, uh, the Janu you know, the Bombay riots happened in two, two phases, in December and in January. And the January riots were supposed to have been set off, a Hindu uh, backlash against Muslims, because a family called the Banes uh, was set on fire in their home in Jogeshwari, in what came to be called the famous Radhabai Chol incident. And it's really ironic that, you know, sort of a, a whole bunch of people were mobilized to take revenge for them, and they themselves do not believe that they need to be avenged. Um, you had some polarizing conversations along your journey, uh, like uh, in a bar in, in Goa. Could you tell us about that? My book allowed uh, me to enter very candid places, you know, uh, very candid pictures, and uh, one of the portraits that I got was... Uh, we had just finished a 350 kilometer ride from Mangalore to Goa. And we get into a bar there run by an old Christian uh, family of Goa, which I discovered recently has been taken over by the Bombay stores in Goa. Uh, when I land up there, I am waiting for a friend from the Times of India. And he said, I'll just come, you just hang on there. And by that time, I see there's another guy who's getting drunk uh, on the, another table. And uh, Eventually, when my friend does land up, he d I discover that he knows this man who was getting drunk. So he calls him over to our table. As, as conversation proceeds, I discover that he was apparently once with the RSS in Belgaum, that's in Karnataka. And uh, the moment I was introduced as a journalist or crime reporter, he asked me, How, do you know of Otto Shankar or somebody in Bangalore? I said, no, I don't. So said, what kind of crime reporter are you? I said, true, very pathetic. So then the problem was, was as he got drunk, he kept trying to corner me into making very definitive statements about what stand I have on the riots. And because obviously the place wasn't very, very good place to conduct serious conversation with drunks when the riots actually are going on, 
I tried to brush him off, but he just tries to, he keeps buttoning, buttonholing me. So then I tell him, okay, you tell me about the RSS. Why do you tell me about your past? So he said, look, RSS makes, establishes character. I said, true. And I told him, I just come back from Kandla after covering the cyclone there. And I was telling, I told him, look, uh, I've seen their good work, you know, when the cyclone had killed so many people, they would go around, there would be RSS volunteers who go and burn the body before they rot and create more trouble in terms of infections and stuff like that. But he wouldn't leave me. Every time I try to avoid him, he'll keep buttonholing me. And then he said, but why do you, what do you call, uh, but you know what, RSS, uh, eventually he slipped and he said, but you know what, they don't allow me to go up. I was re leader material. I didn't quite figure out. And then the issue was that he said he, because he was not a Brahmin, he couldn't get, you know, rise up the ranks. Like I said, these are very, uh, what do you call, um, snapshots of conversation because me trying to avoid and not getting caught, you know, on the wrong foot in a bar. And him trying to only make sure that I'm embarrassed. Finally, eventually, I do get to break loose of him and we have to travel to Kudal. But I started feeling a little guilty because finally the man is drunk. It's not fair to judge him in that count or on whatever talk he was trying to make. So as a, as a kind of uh, reparation to that, I decided after I tied up my stuff onto the bike, I said I should give him a formal farewell. So uh, he's, he's called Nagraj in the book. I've changed his name because of the only name I've changed. Uh, so I go and tell him, oh, okay, Nagaraj, what is it that you want me to do? do what, what do you think is the trouble? Uh, what is the solution to the Hindu-Muslim problem? Uh, do you think we should pack up all those Muslims to back to Pakistan? I thought that was a sitter for him. He can, you know, say something smart and I can get away. Suddenly he turned tail and he said, he, he looked by then, like I said, he's very bleary-eyed by then. He told me something which kind of shook me up. He said, if my brother is mad, do I throw him out of the house? That's, that kind of rattled me quite a bit because I was hoping we were just have, going to have a jousting conversation and leave it at that. But his response kind of rattled me quite a bit. So I'm not even sure if we are very correct about making judgments about anybody, like you were asking me now, you know, when, how do reporters get to talk to people? Because we are talking about intimate and sometimes very hurtful and traumatic things. I suspect the first thing that a man you need to talk to, needs to feel about you is your non-judgmental. Yeah, I just want to add that also they told me a lot of things without my asking them. So if you see, there's one guy who said that, uh, you know, after the blasts in Mumbai, 93, there were no riots. He said that's a lesson, even if Dao taught that lesson to Mumbai, it was worth it. So people were, were, were uh, you know, quite bitter and they were willing to talk. And you, yeah, like you, it's not the question of not only being not judgmental, it's also that you want to listen to what they're saying. And you know, for many of them, they told me you're the first person who's asked us what we think. Mm -hmm. Say, so why do you think we're so important? Mm -hmm. So there was also that, uh, I think they, they felt that they had to speak because uh, nobody has really asked them. Uh, for instance, Rizwan, this guy I met in Bairampara, he said, you're the first person after Sanjay Dutt who's met me and asked me about the riots. So it was quite uh, tragic that uh, they felt very alienated also. Mm -hmm. But they were perfectly willing to talk. And with their names, I've only changed the names of two or three people because I felt they would get into trouble. But uh, otherwise, all the names, I asked them, I said, is it okay, it's a book? They said, oh, it's in English, we don't care. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they were very frank. They didn't hold back anything. And even the teacher, Majid, who I interviewed in Mumbra, he had to go t about three or four times to actually meet him. Because he said, I don't want to talk about it. But when he started talking, we spoke for about in a tea shop for about uh, two, three hours. And he said, you know, now you've made me say everything that I didn't want to say. And so people were frank, uh, people were forthcoming, and uh, I noticed that uh, they had nothing to hide, and their opinions were very controversial. I mean, if you, if you just see the opinions, uh, they, they are not the conventional, scared kind of things, people politely, uh, polite things people say. They do uh, come out, and there's a deep sense of betrayal uh, that's coming out of their statements. You know, despite the notion that uh, no justice has been done in the Sikh, in, in the Sikh riots in Delhi, 445 people have actually been convicted in those riots. The, you know, people like H.E.L. Bhagat and Sajjan Kumar have got away. But, you know, trials have proceeded. In Bombay, you can almost count the number of convictions for the riots 
on your on uh, on your fingers uh, two Shiv Sena leaders in May were convicted for hate speech uh, they were sentenced to a year that sentence was reduced to two months and they got bail anyway uh, by contrast as you point out a hundred people were, tr were convicted for the bomb blasts that followed as a direct consequence of the riots some of them had been sentenced to death this what effect has this differential uh, uh, scope of justice the, uh, had uh, on, on Bombay? I think if you uh, decide to give justice on the basis of which community you belong to, then I think the constitution is meaningless. So uh, straight away the articles which refer to free and fair and equality and stuff are meaningless. And this is what a lot of people realize the hard way. So, uh, you know, I, I met uh, Tahir Wagle just last uh, few months ago his son was shot dead in the riots. Uh, his daughter saw, she was an eyewitness. He was pulled out of the house and killed in cold blood. Till today, the police have not filed a case. In fact, they've accused his son of being a rioter and they have said that uh, he died while rioting. The, the important thing to remember is that there were no riots. We're talking about Mazgaon. There were no riots in that area on the day this boy was killed. And there's enough testimony to believe that he was pulled out of his house and shot. So after the Justice Commission of Inquiry headed by Justice Sri Krishna asked a senior police official to investigate it, there was a DCP who is now a very senior officer, he investigated it and he said that there's only one Muslim eyewitness that is this boy's sister and she's not a credible witness. And this has been, there are four repeated inquiries over the years, the last one just came out a few months ago and they've all said that there is no evidence to prove this boy died. And anyway, the guy who's accused of shot, shooting him is dead, is a constable called Kishore Mankar. So why pursue this case? I was talking to Justice Sri Krishna about this case. He said, at least an FIR could have been lodged. You lodge an FIR, you investigate, and then you say this case has no meaning. You don't even do what is the basic, you know, the basic primary step in in, in an investigation, which is file a case. And this is not the only case. There are people who have not, who have been to, and then finally, uh, this boy, Tahir Wagle, the boy's father, filed a case in the high court. And he said, do something. So the government gave a false testimony saying this case is pending in the Supreme Court and let it decide. So the high court dismissed his petition and that was his last hope. You know, I don't know what to say to Tahir Bhai when he calls me and now he stopped calling me because, because he knows nothing can be done. So this is the desperate, who is Tar Vagli? He's not a rich man, he's not Ajit Pawar, who cares about him? So you know, this is how our society has kind of, uh, you know, people talk of justice to the last and the poorest person, but we're really millions, zillions of miles away from giving justice to, even in obvious cases. I mean, look at the Isha Jahan encounter, I don't want to go into it, but this is how, you know, you're mismanaging justice. What does it, ha what happens to people you know, a lot of the Muslims I interviewed said, ye dunya mein to humko justice nahi milega. Ye is janam mein. And, you know, they keep telling me, you know, this guy is a rioter, he died, Allah has killed him. So they have all these theories, you know, about how justice is being served in various ways. And even the Banis told me that, thing nahi, wo sab mar gaya, wo hum, humko jo mara hai. So, an existing justice system is not working. You can't deliver justice after 20 years. It's meaningless. And, okay, even if you do it, do it with some credibility. I mean, even in the case of Mr. Bal Thakre, every, every time as journalists we asked about the case, they'll say, no, no, now he's an old man, don't worry him like this. So I said, okay, let's wait. And the RTI law came and it took me eight, seven years to get those answers. And they didn't come easily. Could you tell us a little about that? I was going to come to that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I asked for the cases against him and I asked for what had happened and why were there acquittals. So they, I can't tell you the subterfuge the police can indulge in. First they said it's a wrong department, then they sent it to the right. It took years and years. And then finally the commissioner, I went, made two appeals. Finally the information commissioner in 2010, just before the book came out, which is I had to stick it in as the last chapter. Finally he said, okay, just give her all the information. And they gave it to me very reluctantly. They didn't give me all the information and they didn't have, they called me up and said, Madam, sub uh, records to uh, paani mein ga gaib ho gaya, idhar nahi hai hamare paas. There are hundreds of excuses, but what they sent me was enough to show that there were a number of cases 
against the man before the riots, during the riots, after the riots. And finally, there was a letter from the Home Department, uh, Crime Branch, saying all the cases had been sent to the Home Department because under 153A, you need the government's permission to prosecute, which is now being removed in the new bill, which is, has a lot of opposition to it. What is 153A exactly? It's hate speech. It's hate speech causing, I mean, you can check it up, so the IPC. So, uh, that's how, that's what Sarpodar was convicted under another Sena leader who is now no more like uh, Mr. Thakre. So uh, uh, these cases are just pending and the government since 2008, all the consolidated cases are pending with the Home Department which has not taken action. So there's also a complicity between these the right-wing parties and the so-called secular Congress, which is very obvious. I mean, every time they want pres support for the president, Mr. Ms. Pradiva Patil will rush and visit her old friend, Bal Thakre, and then Pranav Mukherjee will come and meet him. So th there's a kind of, uh, you know, feeling that there's no one for you, no one who will fight this case for you, and especially if you're a Muslim. And this is what all those people told me. They said, if you're Muslims, you won't get a house, you won't get a... I mean, the, a senior journalist like Firoz Ashraf moved into a ghetto after the riots, and he was telling me this place is treated like some... It's called mini Pakistan. People say that, you know, they're full of underworld dawns. You don't get a passport if you live in that part of Jogeshwari. So what have we done to this city? You, we, we've shown them that, okay, Muslims, you guys, you deserve the worst. You punished us, you did all these bomb blasts, but people forget that before the bomb blast, there were the riots, which killed nearly a thousand people. I mean, the official figure is 900, but the unofficial figure is much more because there were some 600, 700 people missing who haven't been traced. So uh, you have clearly distinguished, like in Gujarat after Godra, okay, this is where you belong, people. You won't get any job. But I must say in Gujarat, there's a tremendous change. P cases were transferred out of Gujarat. People did get, especially Mehsana, local judges gave very good orders. Unlike here, people just didn't give any orders, didn't file cases, they didn't investigate. It was a shambles. I mean, I can't tell you a worse episode in Mumbai's history than the riots because of the way a, a civil society conducted itself in terms of justice delivery and the police. They were really... I think this is a totally blemished record. It's nice that Meena made this case about how uh, so many Muslims she interviews, usually they tend to be from the lower strata who, for whom, who are more vulnerable like rest of Indian poor. But I just, it just occurred to me suddenly when she mentioned the story about how there's this perception that the state is not for us. That story also gets a lot of strength from a reverse phenomenon, which is a lot of rich Muslims Okay, when they get caught, I'm not talking about riots, I'm not talking about communal issues. I'm talking about rich Muslims or moneyed Muslims, if they get caught in some kind of legal loop, they tend to go to the media saying, it's all because I'm Muslim. Now what it does is, it actually adds up, what you call, strengthening this uh, lower, uh, poorer, what you call, prejudice against. I mean, I have at least offhand, I can think of uh, at least two cases. I won't discuss Azharuddin because that is a silly one. But uh, when East-West uh, Airlines, those of you here who know about it, East-West Airlines was India's first private airline and it came crashing down eventually. But uh, I did a story uh, about how da money from Daud Ibrahim was delivered to its MD at uh, office in Bandra. And the first response of the East-West is, um, as, as journalists we need to call them up, I said, look, there's this case. It's, been, it's in the court. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a confession under Tada, which means it's a... Because it's a Tada confession, it's considered a, what you call evidence, which means the person who is arrested has to prove he's innocent. So it's a very strong law, which is why it can be... And uh, what happened was uh, East West said, I, we are being victimized because we are Muslims. Same way, if you remember Nadim Shravan, the music director team, when they were accused in the murder of uh, Gulshan Kumar, the first thing Nadim said was the same. Now what I'm trying to tell you is uh, this uh, rich-poor gap also gets uh, uh, tend to kind of uh, underline and, and underline the same prejudice for the same community. So let's open it up to the audience. Um, put up your hand and ask a question, please. No speeches. With your experiences writing the book, what actually changes after a riot and how does the concept of communalism affect the uh, 
affect the grassroots levels where you uh, interviewed people who wanted to speak and then did not want to speak. So how does it actually affect the grassroots people who can barely uh, manage two meals a day? How do, does communism as a concept actually affect them? Does communism affect poor people? Of course it does because they're the worst affected in terms of... Uh, um, if you see uh, the riots in, in Mumbai and even if you see Gujarat and the Sikh riots before that, many of the communities targeted were, were the, the slum communities. It, but that is, would be incorrect to say that only the poor were targeted in Mumbai. It, uh, uh, it cut across communities and class, I mean, it cut across classes. Uh, and I know a lot of people were merchants who were upper class who had to leave their homes and go into hiding. So uh, it's not, but yes, the bulk of the people, at least I've, the ones I made a conscious effort to find out who would, because these are the people who won't have a support structure, who have nowhere to go in terms of housing. And, and it, it does uh, create a lot of problems for you. And especially if you're a woman, I think the problems are manifold because you're also looking after children. You have another responsibility. So for instance, I was talking to some women and they said, you know, we don't buy too many nice clothes. We don't buy too many good appliances. You don't know when we'll be attacked again. So there is a trauma, there is a deep psychological trauma, which you will remember. I mean, we only covered the riots and we were traumatized. So you can imagine the people who actually go through, you know, the, the repeated uh, assaults, uh, attacks, uh, insecurities. You're deprived of your basic necessities of livelihood, home, shelter, clothing. I, I, one of my friends who, who was interviewed, Huma, who was interviewed in the book, uh, she's a daughter of a John, she's saying we ran out without slippers and she said when we came back we had to wear other people's clothes. See, small things like that are enough to affect you. People didn't have enough to eat. I was just talking to this uh, woman and her daughter, I didn't include her in the book because I couldn't locate her in time, but she was telling me that uh, her daughter and both of them were raped. They were gang raped in public in Borivli, it was one of the worst episodes of the riots. No one cared about it. Her daughter was burnt, her half burnt body was found and then she was given a decent funeral. The mother was also raped, she was a young woman at that time. And people called her insane. They said she's a mad woman, who would rape her, mad woman and they di discounted her testimony. So this kind of thing, you, if you look at the individual cases, you get an idea of what, and it, it is across the community, there is a de dejection that and, and a sense of insecurity and alienation and plus the double whammy is that you're also accused of being the terrorist. You see Mira Road which I've written about is also the place where uh, 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 a lot of the people were picked up in the 7-Eleven blasts and in the other blasts. They all lived there, they ran away from here and lived there. Danish Etasham who's filing RTI, he's an accused in the 7-Eleven train blast case. So uh, you're kind of depressing uh, uh, people who have no access to justice and you assume that they are guilty without giving them a chance and, and, uh, and you don't give them a chance to uh, enter the justice system of this country. That's what you have done, isn't it? Is that clear or is there some confusion? You're looking totally flummoxed. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky. Why do I feel that there is very little honest attempt to understand or even try to understand the the majority communalism, the Hindu communalism. And uh, are we actually not ignoring the larger issue of communalism without polarizing it by not even trying to understand or investigate into what could be the grievances of the majority community accumulated over the years? Why do I see very little honest uh, literature, very little serious literature on that, investigating what could be the grievances of the majority community that have accumulated over the years and could have could manifest uh, in riots or... So I'm going to ask you a counter question. Why do you think there's very little literature? Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, Rina, who's right behind you, will tell you, as my old sociology professor, there, there are shelves and shelves of literature about this subject, and I think uh, you just need to go out and look for it. I mean, Meena, what's your sense? And Harish, let's start with you. <clears throat> uh, I have a very... I'm coming a little broadly from this uh, into this because uh, I do not know how does one actually complain about the grievances of the majority community. It's a kind of skewed in terms of privilege, you know what I'm saying. If you were to discuss, let's say, poor versus rich, uh, would you actually describe you know, the mansions where the poor, rich live and will that benefit this community as a whole? I mean, the, the whole, I think the poor as well as the 
great. It, it's something like that, and in that sense, it's a bit of a tautology, isn't it? The problem is, if, if, if yeah, I understand your question, if the problem is, uh, are the problems of, let's say, the minority community, like the Muslims, the same as, or how often they converge with that, or the poorer lot from the majority community? Now, that's probably going to be a little more rewarding in terms of asking, I, I, would, I would imagine. Wouldn't you think so? No, I think even the Sachar Commission report shows that, you know, even the poor of two different communities face very different sorts of uh, discrimination. Uh, you know, Abhiram, I think you can answer the question yourself. If, as you say, there are problems with the majority community, okay, how does that problem manifest itself? And why should the problem manifest itself in terms of violence? I agree. I'm not saying all of us, majority, minority, are in a happy situation. But if you look at it from, um, for instance, let's take the issue of cow protection. You want to protect cows, go ahead. But you cannot prevent other communities. There's a different perception about it. And are you going to enforce a diktat that nobody should eat cows, nobody should touch the leather, nobody should do this and that? So if you are trying to say that there is no space for this kind of eclecticism in our society, I agree. But then are you going to kill all the people who don't agree with you? That is the point to be discussed. I, and this also this thing about majority problem, majority community problem. I mean, let's say the Hindus, let's not beat around the bush. This is also a popular uh, uh, thing that is being created. Like, for instance, in, I'll tell you the example of the Shiv Sena that I know of. They said that the Hindus in Mumbai are under threat, and therefore we must vanquish all the Muslims. This is a very simple premise. I've, you were, I don't know if you were there in riots. There are many people here who know the city. There were vigilante squads set up all night with huge lights. People were given food and water to beat back the, you know, the so-called Muslim invasion. There was no one who came to invade. And you know, I don't want to give this blame game who started the riots, the chicken came first or the egg came first, no. I think we should try to understand that problems cannot be addressed by marginalizing communities and violence and killing and you know, in the name of whatever. There has to be other ways of addressing this issue then. And, and I think the political framework that we have currently is not conducive. The political framework that we have now is violent, is, is encouraging violence. So I think let's look at all that and have a debate on those issues. But I'm also not I think don't um, debate it. Just if you want to see an articulation of some of these positions, there's Arun Shuri's books uh, in the mainstream press. There is Swapandas Gupta, there's Chandan Mitra. There's a lot, of, it's not as if anything is stifled. So it's uh, quite interesting that they managed to build the perception that, you know, a certain viewpoint is being held back. But actually, I think it's sort of freely being expressed.